I don't suppose anybody goes into mathematics with the idea of making a lot of money out of it. It's the sort of thing you do because you really like it. But there is one way that you could become very wealthy doing maths, and that's by solving one of the seven Millennium Prize problems that have been put forward by the Clay Institute in the United States. So I'm going to tell you about a few of these problems, and maybe you could have a go at them and become instantly rich. Are you ready? Let's discover the maths. Actually, you're too late in the case of one of the problems. The so-called Poincaré conjecture was solved in 2003. It's named after the French mathematician and theoretical physicist Henri Poincaré and was a major outstanding problem in topology, the study of mathematical properties that don't change if an object is bent or twisted out of shape. At the start of the 20th century, Poincaré noticed something about loops on surfaces that are finite and have no boundaries, such as the surface of a sphere or a torus, a donut shape. Think of a loop as being a curve with the same starting point as ending point, like a circle. Poincaré realized and proved that as far as two-dimensional surfaces go, only on a sphere can any loop be shrunk to a single point while remaining on the surface. In the case of a torus, for instance, there are loops that go round the hole, which, if you tried to shrink them, would end up inside the surface of the torus. Poincaré proposed that his result concerning loops and spheres would generalize to higher dimensions. The higher dimensional equivalent of surfaces, which by definition are two-dimensional, are known as manifolds. Poincaré noticed that the so-called three-sphere, which is the four-dimensional analog of the ordinary sphere, seemed to be the only manifold in which all loops were contractible. But this time he couldn't prove what became known as the Poincaré conjecture. Nevertheless, he went on to propose the generalized Poincaré conjecture that only on the higher dimensional counterparts of spheres can any loop be shrunk to a point without leaving the surface. Oddly enough, this generalized conjecture turned out to be easier to make progress on than the restricted case for the three-sphere. In 1960, the American mathematician Stephen Smale managed to prove it for all dimensions greater than or equal to 5, highlighting a very strange thing about topology. General methods that work in 5 or more dimensions very often don't work in 3D or 4D. This surprising fact has led to topology in at most 4 dimensions being known as low-dimensional topology, and topology in five or more dimensions as high dimensional because the two fields often used different techniques. In 1982, the American mathematician Michael Friedman managed to solve the generalized Poincaré conjecture for 4D, which meant that the generalized conjecture had essentially been reduced to the original 3D statement. However, this specific form of the conjecture turned out to be a much harder nut to crack than any of its higher dimensional cousins. Progress was made in 1982 by Richard Hamilton at Columbia University in the form of something called Ricci flow, after the Italian geometer Gregorio Ricci Cabastro, upon whose work it was based. He was unable to do more than prove some special cases, but it turned out Ricci flow was the key to unlocking the Poincaré conjecture once and for all. In 2002 and 2003, the Russian mathematician Grigory Perelman published three papers that showed how Ricci flow can be used to prove the entire Poincaré conjecture. There were some gaps in his proof, but these gaps were minor and could be filled using the techniques he described. In 2006, two Chinese mathematicians published a verification of Perelman's proof, but implied that they'd come up with the proof on their own and later had to retract their paper and come clean about the proof being Perelman's. In recognition of his achievement, Perelman 
was awarded the Fields Medal, which is the nearest thing to a Nobel Prize in mathematics. However, Perelman refused the medal, and when he was awarded the million dollar Clay Millennium Prize, turned that down as well. He didn't like the fame his achievement had brought him, and thought it unfair that Hamilton's contribution, which he considered equal to his own, had been overlooked. Among the other Clay Millennium problems are two that reveal close ties between maths and physics. One, the Yang Mills and Mass Gap problem, has to do with the world of the very small, the realm in which classical physics gives way to the logic and science of quantum mechanics. In 1954, while sharing an office at Brookhaven National Laboratory, Chinese physicist Chen Ning Yang and American physicist Robert Mills hatched a theory to explain the behavior of the strong force that binds protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. Yang Mill's theory also extends to other ways the subatomic particles can interact, including the electromagnetic and weak forces, and a modern version of it underpins the so-called standard model, which is our best theoretical framework for understanding the known fundamental particles. The first part of the Millennium Problem is to come up with a mathematically rigorous quantum version of Yang Mills that could exist in the real world. The second part is to find the mass gap of this theory, in other words, the minimum mass for a particle that it predicts. In the standard model, the mass gap is the mass of a glue ball, a theoretical particle composed of gluons, the means of holding quarks together in the nucleus, which hasn't yet been observed. The second of the physics-related millennium problems is the Navier-Stokes problem, named after the French engineer Claude-Louis Navier and the British physicist and mathematician George Stokes. The Navier-Stokes equations describe the motion of a fluid while taking into account the pressure and any external forces such as gravity. Fluids seem to obey these equations, but there's one snag. We don't yet know whether the equations have any solution at all. The major problem is with turbulence, in which the fluid becomes completely chaotic and extremely complicated to analyze mathematically. We do have a finite time blow-up result, where the fluid behaves reasonably for a finite time and then suddenly seems to explode, reaching an infinite distance in a finite time. What we really need is a solution that lasts for all time rather than exploding, and we don't know if that's possible. Once a solution is found, the Navier-Stokes problem goes on to ask whether the solution is smooth, in other words, whether it avoids any sudden erratic jumps in the fluid properties. So how come fluids behave realistically in real life? How is it possible that there could be no solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations given that in practice fluids don't suddenly explode? The answer is that, like many things in maths, the Navier-Stokes equations are merely an approximation to the real world. In reality, fluids aren't truly continuous. Once you get to a certain level, they're made up of individual molecules. The Navier-Stokes equations deal only theoretically with perfectly continuous fluids. It goes to show how little we understand turbulence, even though it's an everyday phenomenon. When Werner Heisenberg was asked what he would ask God if given the chance, he replied, When I meet God, I'm going to ask him two questions. Why relativity and why turbulence? I really believe he'll have an answer for the first. In a future video, we'll take a look at some of the other Millennium Prize problems, although one of them, the Riemann hypothesis, already has a video to itself if you want to check it out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again very soon to discover more maths.